Cooper Island. So, here we go. So this is set up for a four-player game. We have the three player boards out there in the corners of that, and then, oh, of course, we're going to have this one over here because, well, you got to have room for everything on the board. So Cooper Island, the theme of this is such that we have discovered an island out here in the ocean, and there are a unique shape, and there are the number of players, there are that many peninsulas. <laughs> each of the players is, has made a harbor on each of those peninsulas, and we're going to be building up our own individual peninsulas via actions that we're going to be taking out there. Now, that's kind of the theme of the game, if you will. Now, before we go any further, let's go over everything that you guys are looking at, both on camera as well as a bunch of stuff that is off camera. So in the main part, we have the main board out here, which is these are action uh, or action selection or worker placement spots here in the middle. So there are eight different spaces out there. Each player has their own peninsula, as you can see here. Within the peninsula, there are five ruins on each of the peninsulas. There is a meadow that is already built or that has already been cultivated and each of these meadows will have a cube of food. Call it spam, call it pigs. If you're vegan, call it some pink food, whatever you want to call it. So there's that. Each player also has two ships. It is important to note that the double sail ship will be facing out to the right and the single sh uh, sail ship will be facing out to go to the left. There are also these uh, logbook spaces out here in between each of the peninsulas. So that's kind of everything there on the main board. Then over here, we have the five supply ships, and they are numbered one, two, through five. And this is also going to be the timer of the game. And each player has a crate lid on top of each of those as well. There are two decks of cards, which are going to be available when players build a small or a large building. And then there are end game uh, victory point or end game goal cards. There are eight of them in a four player game. All of them are right there. Then over here on our player board, we have, well, we have a whole lot going on here with our player tableaus. Again, a reminder, this is a prototype, but to the best of my knowledge, this is the size that everything is going to be, as you see here. And again, these are the pieces from Madeira, so thanks, guys. All right, so what are you guys looking at here? Well, at the very top here, we have the storage space. So this is where you're going to have all of your resources and your coins available to be stored. Then we have our initial uh, income actions up here, as well as places to be able to build our income boats, which are then up here. In addition to that, we have statue crafting spots, only one of which is available. The others have buildings on them that have to be built before they get unlocked. Below that, we have the cartographer track, as well as the available cartographer actions that you can take on a given turn there. Then we have the marketplace, along with anything you see that has this little hourglass symbol, is your anytime actions, as well as your holding place for your marketplace uh, things as players pay you for various actions. Then moving over to the right, we have crate spaces over here and a holding space for as you acquire crates. Notice again in any time action over there. Then up above that, we have the costs and the rules essentially for building buildings, be it statues as well as all of the three types of buildings, the small buildings, the large buildings, and what we're calling the castle there. All right. We have a player aid that goes down the right side of your board here. As you can see, it's going to be over three phases, an income phase, a actions phase, and then a reset or a, uh, an upkeep phase there. Then on this board, which is color coded to your player color, everyone has two workers available to them at the beginning of the game, and then there are four workers that they may be able to acquire as the game goes along, two of which are regular workers and two of which are special workers. Down below that, you have uh, goals which you can attain, and as you attain these, this is how you're going to unlock further workers. Then on the very last uh, bit over here on the left-hand side are your islet tiles, which are going to be part of your income phase as the game goes along. And then the namesake of the game, there's Oda's puppy, Cooper. So there he is. All right. Hi, Coop. All right. 
Now, there are some other things that are off camera. We have the wonderful bag of mystery, which has all of the double tiles on them. Double tiles look a lot like these. We will start with some of these in our possession. The rest will be in that bag. Then we have all of the resources out here, and we have those split between the two sides. We have coins off camera there. Then we have anchor tokens. These are bad. Hopefully you don't see a whole lot of these getting used. Then there are logbook tokens, which are going to be uh, one-time bonuses as well as uh, to represent five points in the game. And then there are a whole bunch of other single tiles that we'll be going over. Again, there's only so much real estate and we want to be zoomed in tight enough so you guys can see everything. And the last thing is handy dandy little player aid. When the game ships, it's going to also come with a scoring uh, pad, which we didn't get one because, well, they're not produced yet, so we don't have one, but it's easy enough. So that's everything that you are looking at here on the board, but now the question is, well, what's the goal of the game? Well, in an over, as an overview, the goal of the game is to score helm points. Helm points are going to be one of only, essentially, two things that you're going to be scoring both during the game as well as at the end of the game. Helm points are how you're going to be moving your ship along the sound sandbars along the edge of the board, be it on your single sail or your double sail ship. So helm points are victory points in this game. You're going to score helm points, and essentially the only other thing that you're going to be scoring are these end game cards that you may have claimed during the game. Essentially, that's it. I've seen scores as low as 12, and I've seen scores as high as 26, so that's not a huge score-producing game. So a couple of helm points in this game are predominantly, or a couple of helm points are going to be a big deal. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, how do I go about getting those helm points? Predominantly, it's going to be from building statues, which are going to be on these places, which or spaces, which are the ruins that are out here on your on your on the your peninsula as well as building buildings building income ships over here so anytime you see this little symbol here these are helm points and finally building supply ships out here those are going to be the main ways you're going to be scoring points in this game and then at the end of the game anything here and you're going to be doing that by taking actions out here, worker placement-esque, on the main board. So kind of an overview, that's what you're looking at. So now let's break into how do you actually play Cooper Island. Oh, and Oda's in chat. Hi, Oda. I know it's late over in Germany, so hey, thanks for joining us. Appreciate you hanging out with us tonight. All right. So the game of Cooper Island is played over five rounds. Each round consists of the same three phases each round. There's going to be an income phase. If you're familiar with games like Gaia Project or Terra Mystica, with the open hand like this, that is carries through into Cooper Island as well. Then there's going to be a worker phase, where we're going to be placing our workers out here and taking actions. And finally, there's going to be a cleanup phase that consists of seven different steps, some of which you're going to skip in a given round if they do not apply. At the end of the fifth round, we then go into final scoring. Whoever has the most helm points at the end of the game wins. All right, so that said, let's go ahead and go into the nitty gritty of how to play. So on your player aid, you're going to see, a, as I mentioned earlier, a little kind or on your player tableau, I'm sorry, you have a player aid over here. The first step is income phase. So you'll notice in the top left of your board you have two things that you can do on the first turn of the game. The first, and you can do these in either order, I do want to stress that, but I'll say the first option is to place one of the eyelet tiles. The second one is to place any of the double tiles that you have in your uh, possession out on the board. So now let's go ahead and talk about We'll start out by talking about placing these double tiles because this is kind of the crux of the game. The main mechanism in this game, if you're familiar with the game Antics from Fragger Brothers, I think from 2010, this game was originally inspired by that game. 
which I find kind of funny because when I was reading the rules, I was like, wow, this sure reminds me of Antics. Read the back of the rule book. Oh, hey, it was inspired while playing a game of Antics. So there you go. I thought that was pretty cool. So to place one of these double tiles, there are four different types of landscape or uh, of different tiles uh, in this game, landscape <coughs> tiles. There are mountains, which are going to produce either stone or gold. There are mountains, which will produce wood. There are meadows, which will produce food. And then there are settlements, which produce cloth. Okay, All four are going to be represented by a single tile, just their orientation of where they are. Maybe it goes meadow and forest on one tile, etc. There are three different combinations of them. But as part of your income, you can place one of these tiles. Now, there are a few different rules for placing these tiles. First off, it must be at least adjacent to one existing tile that's already on your board. So something along the lines of that. In addition of that, you can never cover a ruin. Everybody starts with five ruins out in the same spaces, so I could not do something along the lines of that. Once these are cleared, then you will be able to build upon that space. So that is option one. The most important thing that I want to drive home to everybody is when you place a tile on the board, you are then going to immediately populate it with the respective resource. So in this case, I would put a wood under that tile and a stone under that tile. That is the only time that you will be placing resources on tiles is when you place tiles on the board. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. So that is going to be one option. A second option is if these weren't already taken, and I'll get into that here in a little bit, on a subsequent turn, I could go ahead and place another tile with the matching landscape on top of that tile like so. Which then again, I would, because I placed the tile, place a wood and a stone respectively. Now, you'll note that this is now two tiles high. Therefore, each of these cubes is going to be worth two of whatever that resource is. In this case, this would be worth two wood and this would be worth to stone. Now I realize with a top-down camera, at some point you guys are going to lose track of how high these are. We will just have to be able to update you on this. So if you do so, that is now worth two stone and that is now worth two wood. Does that make sense? Is yes. that easy enough to remember? Yep. All right. The third option is you can what we call shim if need be. Your cartographer track over here, one of the op options is to spend, as an anytime action, one cartographer point going whoop, like so, to then be able to place a double tile onto the board, but you can't have it cattywampus. It <laughs> must be shimmed. So spending one allows you to shim that. What does that mean? Well, let's say I wanted to, on a subsequent turn, put this tile out, and I've already cleared that off like so, and I would like to put this here instead of building it like there for whatever reason. I can do so. I must match the same type of landscape. There is one exception to that rule, which I'll get into in a little bit, but you can take one of these single tiles to place down on the board as a shim to then place that, and then again, because I just placed the tile, that's worth two food, that's worth two stone. So those are your three options. It must be adjacent to an existing tile, it can't be higher than one to shim difference, and it cannot cover one of the ruins. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Okay, all right. And yes, I love the use of the word cattywampus. <laughs> all right, there is an exception to this rule, and that is these settlement tiles. These settlement tiles can cover any type of landscape that you wish. So if I wanted, I could do something along the lines of placing this tile here to where the meadow covers the meadow and the settlement covers, well, something, doesn't matter. When you do so, you then populate it. That would be worth two food and a settlement has cloth and so therefore that would be worth two cloth. Going forward, the only thing that you can then cover that with is more settlement tiles and meadow or settlement tile, etc., etc. Clear? Yeah. All right. So now that we understand that mechanism, and there is no limit to how tall these can be, 
Although there is something that comes into play once we get three high on the mountains, but we'll get into that here in a little bit. So as part of your income, you can place one of those double tiles that you may have there. In addition to that, you can place an eyelet tile. So these eyelet tiles, every player has an identical six eyelet tiles. The, the game is five rounds, which means you're only going to place five of the six, so one of these is not ever going to be placed. When you place the tile, and let's say I choose to place this one right here, as part of my income, I'm going to put it out here on the board. Now an eyelet tile, you'll notice, is half water, half some sort of landscape. When you place it, it must be on ground level, so it cannot be shimmed, it cannot be placed higher. It must be on ground level, and it must cover half of one of these sandbars out here on the board. So in other words, I could place this tile like this, or could place it like this, and it must be adjacent to an existing tile. When you place that tile, you're going to populate it just like normal, like so, with food, and then when you place, you also get whatever the bonus is represented on that. In this case, it is going to be one coin. So you take the coin from the supply. Anytime you get goods or coin, resources or uh, coins from the supply, it goes into your storage. I would like to point out, you start out with five storage spaces. You don't think that's enough? That's okay. Build small buildings. That will build more spaces. Or, when we get there, you'll be able to possibly build an income ship to be able to provide more storage space as well, okay? So, place an income, I'm sorry, place an eyelet and place a double tile. That is the first two steps in income in a given round, okay? The only other rule for placing this is you can never have uh, an entire sandbar covered up because your ships move sandbar to sandbar. So what I cannot do on, say, round two is I could not do something like this, but what I could do is I could do it like so. Obviously, I cannot cover ruins. Same rules apply as regular placement. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. All right, easy enough. So I won't belabor that anymore. There is your income step. Moving on now to actions. That is the meat of the game here. So. On a given turn, everybody starts with two workers. It may become asymmetric to where more players have more workers available, but as it is, whoever is the first player marker and going clockwise in order from there, I'm going to be able to place one worker out onto the available worker placement spaces and take that action. So before we dig into the actions, let's talk about the actual mechanism of placing workers. Everybody has two types of workers, your regular round workers, go on, yep, you guessed it, the round spaces along the outside, yes, around the outside, round outside. thank you, <laughs> yeah. uh, the eight spaces. <laughs> when you go out here, if you cover any bonus that is pictured, you immediately get it. So whatever that is, in this case, Cooper, take the first player marker, okay? As you go along, you then immediately carry out the action. If, however, you place a special worker, which are these square ones, those can go, obviously, only on the square spaces, and you'll get whatever the bonus conveys of those spaces out there. Now, if I were to go out here onto this location and then say, Shrey wanted to then also take this action, he can do so. However, if there was any bonus that I, uh, that I covered up with my marker, he does not get, and in addition to that, whatever marker is directly below his. He must then, if he wishes, pay a fee. The fee can be any one resource or a coin from his storage area. So in this case, all he has in his storage area is a coin. He can also pay off of his tiles any resource that is out there on his board. Now is a good time to go ahead and point this out. If for whatever reason, that tile right there was, say, three high. He would technically be paying three food to me for the one resource to be able to take that action. However, when he gives me that, it's going to then come over here into my marketplace. The game has no memory. And the reason I say that, and the reason I want to stress this is, do I have to remember how much this food represents? Nope because if it's not on the board, it's worth one. 
if you immediately take it off the board to pay for something, it's worth whatever you then paid for or whatever you it was valued at the height. But once it's in either your supply or your marketplace, it's worth one resource. So he might have paid me three, but it actually was only one. So for him to be able to take that action, he would pay me either a coin or a resource from his supply or from the board. But he doesn't have to. What if Shrey says, you know what, I don't want to pay. That's okay. Here you go, Shrey. Have an anchor. Well, the anchor tokens are going to cost you one point. You then can place it, or must place it, beneath one of your two ships. It is now anchored wherever that ship is. To be able to remove that anchor, you have to spend one helm point as you accumulate them to then get rid of that anchor token. If he were to take a second anchor token after he's taken the first one, they must be evenly distributed or distributed between his ships. So the first one goes on his choice, the second one goes on to the other one. If he were to take a third, I would say play better, but if he were, then he could choose between the two, etc., etc., but he has to uh, accumulate them equally between his ships. Those ships cannot move until their anchors are removed, and if they're not removed by the end of the game, they're worth negative one point, okay? So if he doesn't want to pay the fee, he can do so. But I don't miss out. In that case, I get to choose. Do I want a coin or a resource of my choice? So thanks for the bonus, Shrey. I appreciate that, all right? So that is there. Now, if then, at that point, Jess comes out and says, hey, I want to take that action, she doesn't have to pay me and Shrey. She only has to pay the player she covered. She covers Shrey, so therefore, she may be planned a little bit better. So therefore, let's say she had that out there to start, and she says, you know what, I don't mind giving up a food, so here you go, Shrey, have a food, there you go, no anchors for me, and then she can carry out the action. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. The last thing I want to drive home about this is, you'll note that I have a marker in that stack. I cannot place another marker in that stack because I've already taken that action. However, and Oda can correct me if I'm wrong on this, you can, however, because it's a different stack, if I have a special worker, I can do it as a, uh, a normal worker and as a special worker because those are different stacks. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So now that we have driven home the actual mechanism of taking actions, let's go ahead and talk about what the various actions are in the game. So starting here, we're going to hit the cardinals first. So A, C, E, and G, or Al Alpha, Charlie, Echo, and Golf, because Marine. Go here, cover Cooper, you immediately take first player. The action as shown here says you can draw one tile from the bag of mystery. Or, notice the slash, place one tile that you may have already accumulated out here on the board following the normal placement rules. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Okay. Yes. In addition to that, you then can increase your cartographer track one step. What's that look like? This. If you were to reach the sixth space and then go past it, plan better. Ping, you get nothing. Ping, you get nothing. So spend them, spend them if you got them. Okay? Mm -hmm. Any questions about that space? Nope. I will talk about the special worker spots when we get to that. Moving then over to this location. It's just like this, except instead of either or, it's both. But you don't get to do the cartographer. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving on. This one, move three cartographer spaces, and in addition to that, get one coin or one resource of your choice. It could be any resource. It could be gold, it could be cloth, it could be food, it could be whatever you want. Finally, over here at the G space, it's just like this, but twice as good. You can draw two tiles out of the bag of mystery or place two tiles and it's your choice on where you place following the normal rules on placement. Any questions about that? Okay, I'll get I'll take silence. No. <laughs> no questions. Okay, all right, good. Moving on. <laughs> all right, now we'll talk about Bravo, Delta, Fox, and Hotel Spaces. This one here allows you to build an income ship. You might be asking yourself, self. How much does it cost to build an income ship? Well, I'm glad you asked. Your choice of which to build over here on the left side of your board. 
the cost, you can build this one first if you want. Maybe you have two wood out there on a too high wood space, so you don't want to waste the wood, so you build this one first before you build that one. Okay, no harm, no foul, go for it. You pay the coins, you pay the wood from your supply or from your board itself. And then when you do so, you then choose one of the income ships. When you choose that income ship, you then cover the space. You immediately get whatever the income ship, even though it's not the income phase, you get it when you build it, and then you will get it every subsequent income turn. So in this case, I would take a coin from the supply and put it out there, boom. But you're going to notice, oh, hey, we also get a home point. Hey, awesome, we're on the board. What does that mean? Now we finally get to move ships. So now let's interrupt this for a moment and talk about helm points. Helm points are the goal of the game. Score helm points. Those are good. Any single action that you take that grants you helm points, you may move either ship, your choice, but they all must be expended on the same ship. The double uh, sail will move anti-clockwise and the single sail will always move clockwise. Why? This way, as they move around, you don't get confused what direction a ship was moving. So on my turn, I got one helm point. So let's say I move, and again, they move sandbar to sandbar. Anytime you cover any islet tile, whether it's yours or another player's that they may have built as you move along, you immediately score whatever that bonus is. Oh, hey, I get another coin. I am seriously racking up some coins here, as it were, okay? So that's what, if I were to then get another helm point, or maybe I got three helm points in an action, I could go one, two, three, easy enough. However, when you reach one of these spaces right here, which also have little sandbars on them, you're going to notice that it has a little log book on it. When you reach that space, you're going to draw one of the log books from out of here, you immediately get the one-time bonus of whatever it is. It's usually a good or a coin or something along the lines. If you have the space in your story. <coughs> so we come over here. Oh, it's a gold or a cloth. Lucky me, I do have space there. However, if I did not have space, it would be lost. In that case, I then would get my log book. I would put it up here. And that's going to be a reminder that that's where I've scored five points at the end of the game. That also will apply when you reach someone else's harbor over here. You would then get another logbook, etc., etc. But at that point, anytime you reach a harbor, which, God bless you, if you were to circumnavigate the entire way and reach your own harbor or someone else's, you have to pay a fee. If you don't pay the fee, that's okay. You take an anchor, though, on either ship. Same rules apply as normal, but they get to then get the fee, which is one coin or a resource of their choice. Okay, so that's helm points. Did I mention these are the goal of the game? Get helm points, mm -hmm. these are very important. So that is building an income ship. You'll get the income when you build that ship and every income phase in subsequent rounds. Any questions about that action? No. Nope. Nope. Awesome, moving on. Let's go ahead and build some buildings, shall we? What's the cost of building these buildings, you might ask? Well. Depends what building you're building. You have small buildings, large buildings, and the fortress or castle or whatever you want to call it. Here we go. Small buildings cost one coin, two wood, and two stone. Again, it can come from anywhere out here on your board or out on the board itself. So let me go ahead and set this up, and I will do so so you guys can watch. That were a level one, and then this is amazing. There we go. Then if I were to build that on maybe an earlier turn, I now have two wood and two stone like so because that's too high. Okay? So to be able to build a building, and I want to build, let's say, the small building here, I would pay one coin from here and any mix of resources from here that equal the two stone or the two wood there. I have two stone and two wood here, so I take those off. I've now paid to build my small building. When you build that, you then choose one of the two small buildings that's out here. You're going to build it. If you had built it on a settlement space, you get one additional helm point plus the helm point that it provides. 
So as it is, it's not going to be on a settlement space, or is it? Every building and every statue that you build must be built on the highest plateau of an empty space that you have in your peninsula. So these are each too high, and let's say I had cleared, the, or no, let's say I hadn't. This is not empty, and let's say maybe I didn't have to pay that stone out there, but I did earlier maybe use that food, whatever. I have a two high woods and a one high meadow. Therefore, my only choice is to build on the two high forest. Easy enough. If I, it were like this, I would have my choice to cover up there and there. Once a building that, or a statue is built on a given tile, it can no longer be built upon because, well, you now have a building on it in the way or a statue. Easy enough? Yep. All right. Food does block or resources do block. So if it were something like this, because maybe I paid through resources I already had on my board, the highest available is the meadow. That's the only place that I could build that. So therefore, I then could do like so, okay? When you build it, as I said, you get a helm point. Oh, hey, there we go. Obviously, it would be moving along. You get the idea. I would score the helm point as shown here. In addition to that, you're going to be able to draw cards. Now, there are two decks of cards in the game. There are small buildings and there are large buildings. These small buildings, and I'll show these, I might as well show it now. These have some sort of permanent rule breaker that is only for you, all right? That is just going to be an ongoing benefit. When you build a building, you get to draw four of these cards, choose to keep one, discard the other three at the bottom of the deck in any order that you choose. Easy enough. So I would keep it up here, and there you go. It would be a rule breaker for me going forward. If it were a large building that I had built, then I would choose from the large building deck, which, again, choose four, keep one. These, however, are going to be powerful one-time use, sort of one-time use, because when you use it, you're going to flip the card over but there are ways to then reactivate that card later on on a subsequent round, okay? So, build a building, get home points, get an extra home point if you built on a settlement, and then get your cards. And you'll notice that building on those two buildings, one home point, two home points, but it's a higher cost, and that will give you another statue space, et cetera, et cetera. Any questions about building those two buildings? Nope. nope. The fortress here, the castle, I'm going to cover the mechanism of building is the exact same. You're, it takes six wood, three stone, three cloth, and three gold, and you get four helm points. However, the benefit for this is going to be a little bit different. I'm going to talk about that later. Again, it must be built on the highest level of an available space, yada, yada, yada. All right? So that is building buildings out here. The next one over here is... In either or, take a ruin off the board or build a statue. Taking a ruin off the board, you have to take a ruin that is adjacent to an existing tile. So what does that mean? This is the only one that I could take because I have no tiles. I have not cultivated land close enough to those ruins. If I choose to take that action, I take this, I flip it over to the statue side, and I place it over here. Done. However, if I already have that on my board and I want to build a statue, I then come over here. I either pay three wood or three stone or two wood and two gold, and I build a statue. Works fundamentally identical to building buildings. Has to be on the highest level, that's empty, etc., etc. So if I were to then come out here and build a build or build a statue, let's say like so, they're built. When I do so, I will get one helm point. I will get one additional helm point if it were built on a settlement, etc., etc. Okay? Yep. All right. Any questions about building statues? Nope. All right. Before I go any further on to the last action, I want to talk about how to manipulate things to where you're building on settlement spaces, as well as the cartographer track here. Once during the income phase, once 
per action that you take, meaning each worker time you put a worker out, and once during the upkeep phase, you can use the cartographer track. So in the first round, in theory, you could use it four times. Once, once, and then you have two workers, twice, okay? There are four different ways in which you can spend cartographer points. The first one we've already covered, which is anytime you place a tile, if you need to shim it, you would spend one cartographer point in which to do so. The other three actions have to do with placing a single tile out here on the board. Depending on the height of the final tile, is going to be dictate the cost and cartographer points. What I mean by that is, if you build on the ground level, if it is one high, it will cost you two cartographer points. If when you are done building, it is two to four high, it will cost you three cartographer points. And finally, if it's five or higher, it will cost you four cartographer points. So let's say I had four cartographer points out here. And on an earlier turn, I sp one, spent two to put out a single tile out here on the board. So I put a single tile out here on the board. When I put a tile on the board, what happens? I put a resource on top of it. That's worth one wood. When I put my second worker out here on the board, I could take another cartographer action. Maybe I spend another two out there to then place another tile. Maybe I want to put another wood out there. And now all of a sudden, when I want to build, I have two stone, because that's too high, a single high wood and a single high wood, so that would be two and two for maybe being able to build a small building. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. In lieu of maybe building that last one, and let's say I had three cartographer points left. And let's go back to our example earlier where we wanted to build this small building. It costs one coin, two wood, and two stone. Well, I pay the coin from here. I pay the two wood and the two stone from a two high respective space out here on the board. Now, any time actions mean any time. A cartographer is an any time action. So what does that mean? I can then spend three cartographer points to then be able to put out a single settlement tile that the final height is two to four high. Well, if I want to go ahead and cover up one of these, that would be a total of three high. I could do so, and that would put out three cloth. But I can, as an any time action, take that cloth, put it into my tableau, and now I can continue that action of building that building. I've already paid, and oh hey, that's now the highest one. It must be built on that and I put it on the settlement. Why do I want to put it on a settlement, if at all possible? Because I not only get one helm point, but I get an additional helm point if it's built on a settlement. And then I get to draw my cards, etc., etc. So I guess that might be going a little bit into strategy, but I wanted to stress that you can interrupt any action in this game with any time actions, except for one. You are limited in your space, in your storeroom. You cannot move things from here as an any time action to here to then pay for them. It has to be done beforehand or after. So the only any time action you cannot do any time is during a pain to build or something like that to move from here to up there. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. Getting back to it now. We've covered all the actions out here except for one, which is supply ships. Supply ships numbered one, two, three, four, five, also double as the timer of the game. The cost in the first round is three gold and two cloth to build this supply ship. Every player has one of these tiny little cargo lids on there. When you build that supply ship, you're going to then take that cargo lid. The first player to build it will then stand this little guy up to show the harbor master to show that he's been used. He gives a single discount on any resource shown. So it could be two gold and two cloth, or three gold and one cloth, if you want, for example, on that. If it were the fourth round, he only gives a discount to this one. However, you can build any ship up to that round 
you just won't get the discount for it. And obviously, as long as you haven't taken the cargo lid. When you do it, you take the cargo lid. I'll continue with that in a moment. You also take a helm point or however many helm points as shown there. You then take your cargo lid, put it over here, and as in any time action, you can take any of those five associated actions. Draw a double tile from the bag, place a double tile onto the board. If you need to shim it, it will cost you one cartographer point. Add two to your cartographer track, get two coins into your marketplace, or get any two resources, and I do mean any two, into your marketplace. But when you do so, you're using that like so. So maybe, uh, let's say I go there and maybe I want to make that a wood and a stone. It could be two wood, could be two gold, etc., etc. That is the last action out there. That makes sense? Yep. So those are all the available actions. Before I go any further now, let's talk about how do you get more workers. Well, you'll notice that all of these accomplishment tiles over here show two statues, two any building built, two cargo lids or two income ships. Once you, the moment you attain one of those goals, whatever it is, so maybe I built two buildings out there. I then flip this over to the check mark and then either immediately or at your leisure on a subsequent round or turn or any other time you want, you then can move that over to cover one of this, these spaces. Two helm points or get a new worker. If I choose to go ahead and get a new worker, I then immediately choose one of my four available workers. You do not have to go left or right. However, I do want to stress, the further right you go, the more upkeep, the more feeding that you're going to have at the end of the round. But let's say I want to just go ahead and take one of those regular workers. Easy enough, boom, done. So I have a new worker immediately available when I do that. Mm -hmm. However, if I choose to hire one of my special workers, something a little bit different is going to happen. If I have any number of available workers still up here, regular workers, I activate that worker, and then I'm going to take this regular worker out here, and he's now going to claim one of the end game goals of the eight that is out there, and he will permanently be out here for the rest of the game. Notice the one time, meaning once it's claimed, it's claimed, and that's that, okay? However, if when I activate this, I have no regular workers available because they're all out on the uh, various worker placement spaces out here already. If that's the case, this worker then comes out and immediately covers one of these spaces and that's lost for the rest of the game. So plan well on that. Mm -hmm. I'll briefly go over what these eight are. They are going to be some accomplishment that you've reached by the end of the game. Income ships. If you've built three, four, or five, score three, five, or eight points respectively. If you haven't built that many, guess what? You don't score it at the end of the game. This one is based on number of buildings, same rules. Number of statues, same rules. Number of cargo lids, same rules. This one is how many landscape spaces out here are five high, five tall. They don't have to be contiguous, just how many do you have, four, five, or six, for three, five, or eight points respectively. How many uncharted spaces, how many empty spaces do you have out here on your board? And as you can see, I don't need to go over that. How many landscape of a single contiguous group do you have height regardless? There you go. And this one gets you, allows you to copy any other player's card out here. However, the penalty for doing so is you're going to score one less point for doing so. Okay? So that is getting new workers. The reason I point that out now is let's briefly go over what the special rules are on all of these. Remember, it's only first come, first serve, because once it's covered, it's covered. Nobody else gets that bonus. Instead of either or, it's a plus. You get to do both those plus the cartographer. Get a discount of two. Now it does show a slash between money and resources. It could be a discount of one money and one resource, two money or two resources. Mix and match however you want to build an income ship. This is get one islet action bonus for your tiles that you built or any other player has built. 
A discount of two when building, same rules apply as the income ship. This is take one income ship bonus immediately that's been built between you and all the other players. Choose one. Instead of an either or on the statues, do both and you can do so in any order. This is twice as good as this one. Either get two and a cartographer or place two and get a cartographer. And finally, this is in addition to building the supply ship, it is either draw a double tile or place a double tile on your peninsula. So that carries us through all of the action phase. <coughs> Finally, there's the upkeep phase. Feed your peeps. It's going to be two food for your, first, or for your first two workers and then as shown on these. You'll notice that these last two cost two food each. However, if you successfully feed everybody, you then get one or two helm points depending on how many of those workers you have activated. If you don't, for every food that you haven't paid, you get an anchor. Same rules apply, normal anchor rules apply. The next step is you can unlock one cargo lid. Oh, you have a coin? Okay. I can discard a coin and, oh, hey, reactivate that like so. I, if I had multiple out here, I could only unlock one. It shows times one. Or I could unlock one of those big buildings that I flipped over and used. I then can flip it back over and reactivate it. Remember I said I was going to get back to the big building, the, the castle? If you build that, you can do both of those, and you can do both of those for free. Mm -hmm. But still only one each. Okay. Then, for each statue every player has built, they get a helm point. Move your ships. The next one is if you have built or cultivated the land on the three highest spaces on your board, all three of them, you get one cartog or one helm point. Meaning three these three spaces, you will have already had to have removed the two ruins out there and possibly built the statues that are associated with it. Then get all your workers back. Then move everything in your marketplace up to your supply. If you have room, great. If you don't, you can never discard anything up here. You can discard from here because you don't have room at this point. In fact, you must, but you can never discard from here. But again, that's an anytime action. You could do so earlier if you want, but as it is, that will always happen at the end of the round. Then last but not least, move the Harbor Master. Unless it's the last round, then go into final scoring. The last thing that I want to point out are these anytime actions for things here on your board or on your peninsula. You could turn in two cloth for one coin. The coin will come down here. Turn in two gold for any one resource, including a gold. Seems wasteful, but you could conceivably do it. And then lastly, four resources or any mix of them and coins to then turn them into one anything you want, coin or resource, which goes here. And if you have the room and you're desperate for it, hey, maybe I just made a gold, you then can bring it up here and then you can spend it to your heart's content. Then we go into final scoring. Final scoring is going to consist of very, very simple things. You're going to score five points for each of your log books. Well, you can also count. One, two, three, four, five sandbars. Oh, you would have gotten a log book. So there you go. So if my ship were there, and let's say this ship were there, I will have gotten one, two, three log books. So I know I'm at 15 plus one, two, three, plus one, two, three. So 15 plus six, 21 points in helm points. That makes sense? Yep. Yes. Yep. Then any of these that you've claimed and meet the number, the uh, prerequisite, score those points. If there are any white flags, which are pretty rare, but they're in the top right-hand corner of these cards, you then score. And it says so in the text as well. You score those. Then you score or you add up anything left in your supply here as well as any double tiles that you have left over and any cartographer points. So let's say I had it something along the lines of this. That's two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Divide that by five, that's one point. I get one helm point. If I had a tenth, I would have then gotten two helm points 
before that, minus any anchors that somebody may have, and then whoever has the most points wins. And that, folks, is how you play Cooper Island. Any questions? No good. All right. <laughs> Eh, all right. It was a little longer than I thought, but <laughs> shocker. All right. Give me a chance to reset up my board and set all of this stuff up. Place your bets. We'll set uh, the over-under on Glory to Rome's. I'm going to set it to two and a half because I don't <coughs> think we're going to get in each other's way too, too much in this. I could be wrong. Let's see. i got to clear all this off. Right I need that there. Thank you there. Am I forgetting anything else? I suppose I ought to clear all that off my board. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all the double tiles can go back into the bag. Had a bunch for examples. And any questions from the peanut gallery that you guys saw? None that weren't answered. None? Okay. 